Welcome back. I'm so sorry, everybody. You get all this expensive equipment donated to you, and yet it doesn't work. Um, so I apologize for that. Can you hear me? I'm saying words. Let me know how my audio is. Good. This might be, um, will work. So welcome back, everybody. Uh, let me just get everybody back so far so good nice you guys must have been praying for me that's what we forgot to do we forgot to do a prayer in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit now endeavor into ages of ages oh man the lord bless this stream and the audio and the signal strength and keep the evil one away sounds crisp great so i think we fixed it and I think we can get back. So I'll just start it over if that's okay. If you guys don't mind. If you don't mind my little earbuds. Welcome to the Norwegian News with your host, Father Deacon Ann Nice. And tonight we're going to talk about an orthodox theory of knowledge. And specifically within that, we're going to talk about apophaticism, asceticism, and its relationship to humility. And I'd like to begin with Romans, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man to birds and four-footed beasts and creepy things. Creeping things. So this is a presentation about an orthodox theory of knowledge. And we're going to examine the spiritual use of apophaticism, asceticism, and humility to show that the only valid justification for the possibility of knowledge is for man to presuppose what's been revealed to the orthodox church. And I love the psalm Psalm 117 that says, God is the Lord and has revealed himself to us. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So keep that in mind as we go through that, um, this lecture and this talk about an orthodox theory of knowledge. Because by practicing what's contained in divine revelation, man can unite himself to Christ and begin to heal the intellect to gain a true foundation a true foundation for knowledge and obtain genuine understanding. And what I mean by when I say the only valid justification for the possibility of knowledge and experience is that certain conditions have to be met, that is, satisfied, in order for man to acquire genuine knowledge and to justify any successful use of reason. And what I'm going to argue here tonight is that the only valid preconditions for the possibility of intelligibility Science, logic, experience, and morality is God. In other words, we have to see human reason not as something autonomous, but actually grounded and completed in divine, in his divine revelation to mankind in the Theanthropos, the Lord Jesus Christ of the most holy trinity, who's revealed himself as the light of men as the precondition for the possibility of any experience and knowledge. And furthermore, it's the Orthodox Church, by having received and faithfully preserved the fullness of God's revelation to mankind that grants the believer access to this transcendent reality in order to experience God and know Him in His divine energies by the appropriate spiritual use of apophaticism, which we'll talk about as the way of negation. This intellectual way of negation, it's an ascetic and spiritual exercise. And it provides one with a true knowledge of God. And through divine revelation, the intellect is illumined by grace 
is radically transformed within an authentic noetic experience that's ultimately aimed at ontologically changing the knower to be conformed to the image of Christ. Gnosis, one of the Greek words for knowledge, therefore, is actually for the sake of theosis and the Christian's deification in union with God. So far, so good, everybody. Okay, everybody's in, so we'll continue. I'm just uh, checking in on the chat once in a while to see if you guys have any questions um, or if there was any issues with sound or video again. Okay, looks good, so let's return back. If we turn to St. Dionysius the Arpegite, and he tells us that such a union, quote, with those divinized, with the light that comes from on high, takes place by virtue of all cessation of all intellectual activity. And when we find that through the apophatic ascetical practice, one ceases all such intellectual activity. And it's really through this still silence, heskia. And heskia is the Greek word for quietness, stillness. And it, it's a type of asceticism in Eastern Orthodoxy that stresses silence, purity in prayer, and implies a state of silence. It's a mystical tradition, a prayer whereby one draws the noose, um, the mind, and the Greeks, you know, Hellenistic sense into the heart and retreats inward by ceasing to engage with the senses in order to obtain an experiential knowledge of God, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, as Philippian says. And this practice is incorporated by the Desert Fathers and traces back to Christ's own words when he says, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet and when thou hast shut the door, pray. And when we enter into the silence, we encounter and, and we receive a gift. Gnosis is placed beyond the demands of surmounting and a test. And the, uh, the arrest of thought, really, as Lasky puts it. And when it engages in silent contemplation, one opens thought to a reality that lies beyond all thought itself. And this type of thought is really a new mode of thinking, such that thought does not include, does not seize, but finds itself included and seized, mortified and vivified by contemplative faith, as Olofsky goes on to say. And so this really is a, what we call an apophatic humility, where the intellect, again, I said, is brought down into the heart, the noose, in the patristic sense of the word, news. And it learns at this point in the silence to listen to the voice of God so that now knowledge of him is given to us by faith, that is to say by a participatory adherence in the presence of him who reveals himself. And it's here that we begin to experience and know God and partake in his divine and deifying gifts, his divine energies. And thus, Faith, well, actually, let me, let me give you a nice quote before I go on from St. Simeon, the new theologian. Quote, For he who partakes of the divine and deified gifts is not alone, but with you, my Christ, who came for the thrice radiant light which enlightens the world. Now, some of you might recognize that is actually one of the pre-communion prayers of St. Simeon, one of my favorite saints. And what we learn is that faith is it's not a psychological attitude. It's not a mere fidelity. The orthodox faith is an ontological relationship between man and God, and it serves as a necessary condition for any possibility of knowledge, which also includes knowing God and what God reveals of himself to us, both in nature, which we'd call natural theology, 
and in the act of humble devotion and prayer, asceticism. Furthermore, quote, here's a, a Lasky quote for you. He states, this mystery of faith is personal encounter and ontological participation is the unique foundation of theological language, a language that Abiphasis opens to the silence of deification, end quote. So I'm going to be using a lot of Alosky, and how's it going on? I'm just checking in on the chat. Occasionally, I'll, I'll drop in and look at the chat. Any lagging? My bitrate setting. Yeah, let's see. Let me see if I can switch my bitrate setting. I know I feel like a boomer on the, you're going to have to bear with me on the, okay, let's see if that works better. All right, I lowered the buy trade. Let's see. Just give it a second. How is it now, guys? Yeah, I'm on Wi Fi. Um And the Wi-Fi has been acting up all day. Low signal strength. If you remember back, I was doing some videos. I actually had to do it somewhere else because we were having so many problems. Hold on, I misspelled. Okay, going, are we back on? Okay, good. So let us return back to contemplating a theory of knowledge and orthodoxy and apophaticism. So if you think about it, the apophatic ascent to the divine is articulating the fathers, the faith of the fathers, the faith that established the universe is therefore quote, an internally objective relationship for which the catechumen prepares himself and through which baptism and chrismation are conferred upon the faithful, gifts which restore and vivify the deepest nature of man. So again, I'm going to throw out a lot of Lasky quotes. That's a quote from Lasky. And this really is the only valid justification for the possibility of knowledge and human experience, since not only... Does the unique presupposition ground and provide us with the necessary and sufficient justification for intelligibility, science, logic, experience, and morality? It restores the very nature of the human being itself. Now, are you guys picking up any of the background modified exhaust sounds that I have to listen to 24 hours a day? I cannot get these people in my neighborhood to be quiet and settle down. There is no peace.
Okay, looks. Yeah, that's what, thank you, uh, Sonic, by the way. Um, Sonic has a great suggestion here or comment that when you have a high bite rate but a poor connection, it's going to cause streaming problems. So what I did is I prayed to the Lord God and the Lord God of the Holy Trinity told me, you need to lower your bite rate. What are you doing? You. So I did. I listened to the Lord and um, it looks like we're good to go. And uh, also his servant, Sonic. Thank you. Looking, sounding much better. Yeah, did you hear the straight up ghetto? Yeah, that isn't even the loudest of, of them either. I mean, it gets insane. Um, it gets so insane sometimes that you even have people crash 50 miles per hour into your apartment complex, which is a story I'll have to share with all of you some other time. But now we've got to really focus on what is this orthodox theory of knowledge that Father Deacon is talking about? And what is apophaticism? So shall we return? Well, in order to talk about apophaticism, we're really going to need to talk about the nature of language. So we know that when we're talking about God, especially concerning his nature, human language is entirely inadequate. St. Clement of Alexandria tells us that, quote, human language is incapable of expressing anything essential about God. And he explains that human speech, quote, is by nature feeble and incapable of uttering God, end quote. Uh, this follows along the same lines as St. John of Damascus, who declares that it's clear that God exists, but what he is in his essence and nature is beyond all understanding. So you're probably wondering, well, how do we talk about that which is unknowable and beyond speech? How do you even name the unknowable? If by naming, you're expressing something as you conceive it in your understanding. And here we find that St. Gregory of Palamas is quite helpful in his quote. He states, the superessential nature of God is not a subject for speech or thought or even contemplation, for it is far removed from all that which exists and more than unknowable. I like that. There is no name hereby it can be named, neither in this age nor in the age to come, nor word found in the soul and uttered by the tongue, nor contact, whether sensible or intellectual, nor yet any image which may be afforded any knowledge of its subject, if this be not that perfect incomprehensibility which one acknowledges and denying that all can be named. None can properly name its essence or nature even if he be truly seeking truth that is above all truth. So if there's no theological term that's adequate to the thought of the speaker or want of the questioner because language is of natural necessity too weak, too weak to act in the service of, ob of the object of thought, it's here that apophatic theology becomes necessary for those who desire to continue their quest for the divine. The Father's understanding that human thought and language are both inadequate and incapable of expressing and grasping the reality of God use apophatic language to talk about God, the God who's utterly transcendent. Now what is apophatic language? It's the way of negation is talking about things in terms of what they're not. As I had stated in the previous video that I had the ditch because of the bad audio and video. Here's an example of the way of negation that we can say true things in our acts of predication about something. Such our language is intentionally hitting an object but removing the things that do not belong to it. For example, this is not my wife, this is not my car, and this is not my house. They're all true predications. And that serves very useful when we get to something like God, who's utterly transcendent and is not the subject for thought or even contemplation. When we're trying to use language, talk about his essence. Him who lives in a luminous darkness, a dark cloud. Well, apophatic language in the way of negation is very useful because it's the process of negating all positive terms predicated of God and then that 
in turn will subsequently lead us to a true knowledge of God. If we turn to Alex Nestruk, he states, apophaticism can be understood as the inability of reason, the Greek word for reason in this one is dionia, the inability of reason to have any direct apprehension of God. At the same time, apophaticism means that any rational discursive definitions of God as truth are going to be adequate. That is, the rational concept of truth is not possible. Well, when we're speaking about this, it's obviously going to lead us to, to consider the nature of knowledge itself. And when we consider the existence of knowledge, facts, the validity of logic, arguments, the conclusions derived from experience, etc., an important question arises for the reflective inquiry. How does one determine that human reason, unaided by any other powers, can actually accomplish what it sets out to do? Namely, to know reality and what's true. In other words, what I'm really asking here is that within the sphere of human reason alone, can we ever even determine whether knowledge exists? Since everyone is going to presuppose something. In this case, obviously, we're presupposing <laughs> our reason works, logic, a pre-commitment to evidence, logic, arguments, etc. We presuppose that our faculties are constituted such that we actually apprehend reality correctly. Then there's no one, when you think about it, who's presuppositionally neutral the, when it comes to factual questions and experience. What does that mean? Well, consequently, the use of reason, logic, evidence, arguments is not something that you is proven by experience or reason. It's the other way around. Logic, reason, Evidence, arguments, is that which proves everything else. And if you think about this further, what we find in such an analysis is that rather than proving facts and logic, arguments, etc., one necessarily begs the question. How? Well, ask someone, how do you determine that your rational faculties can obtain knowledge? And one will inevitably appeal to their rational faculties to establish what they want to prove. For example, I asked the question, well, how is it that my faculties are constituted such that I'm actually apprehending reality correctly? Because we definitely know and we'd admit that either through the use of drugs or alcohol or let's say somebody has some type of mental illness like schizophrenia or the, the multiple other mental disorders of which we'd all agree that, well, their faculties aren't such that they're actually apprehending reality correctly. Is it fair to say that, therefore, our faculties are? I mean, the only thing you could say at this point is there's a difference. But it's an assumption, and what's going to turn out to be begging the question to assume that, yes, I know that my faculties are such and such that it does apprehend reality correctly. Why is it begging the question? Because if your faculties and what's called rationality is in question, you can't go around and go, well, how do I know those work? Let me actually use my faculties and rationality to tell you how my faculties and rationality works. That, that would be like, Everything in this book is true, and you ask me how I know that, because it says on page 105, everything in this book is true. We are begging the question. The book is suspect. You can't use the book to validate and prove the book. You cannot use, if your faculties and rationality is what's in question and suspect, you cannot use that then, therefore, to come back and validate and justify 
that's circular reasoning and is begging the question. And so there are two questions that obviously arise. One, what's the necessary preconditions of knowledge and intelligibility that must be presupposed to ground and justify the use of reason, logic, and evidence, arguments, etc.? And again, two, can human reason, when isolated solely within its own sphere of reason, let's call that autonomous reason, ever determine whether its processes are legitimate such that we can know anything at all? without falling into the vicious circularity of epistemic bootstrapping, which is what I illustrated earlier. Bootstrapping, what's supporting you, my boots, what's supporting your boots, I'm pulling them up, you're going in circles, and so you never actually justify or validate being supported, and so knowledge is going to work the same way. Um, what is validating and justify your use of reason? My use of reason. It's epistemic bootstrapping. And what the history of philosophy and epistemology teaches us is that when man's isolated within his own sphere of reason and committed to an autonomous epistemology, apart from theistic revelation, man can't justify the existence of knowledge, true justified beliefs, or establish whether his rational processes are legitimate even, tragically so. And tragically, man, in his pretended autonomy, because that's really what it is, they're pretending to be autonomous and can operate apart from God and the presuppositions of God. And it's rebellion. It's rebellion against God, and therefore man's incapable of knowing the nature of himself, logic, the world, universals, how all they all are, how they could be, related to one another and in short man can't obtain a coherent theory of knowledge consequently that means that no beliefs can be justified no beliefs can attain the level of knowledge now I'd like to turn to another saint that I think that you'll like Just checking in on the, the chat. Okay. And by the way, when we say reason cannot comprehend God, um, we're, we're going to draw this distinction out too about between essence and energies. All of this, God remains incomprehensible in his essence in this life and the next as well. But I'd like to turn to St. Justin Popovich who explains there's an un bridgeable gap between man and truth. Man on one side of the gulf and can find no way of getting to the other where transcendent truth is to be found. And this is taken from, in case you're interested, um, St. Justin Popovich, The Theory of Knowledge of Isaac the Syrian in, let's see, I think it's God and um, out of a larger work in the God man so reason man there's an unbridgeable gulf between man and truth and what that means is that reason unaided or helped in some ways incapable of determining whether its processes are legitimate and whether it can know anything at all hence reason requires some help it requires the help of the divine and supernatural assistance by grace and through faith. And it's this faith that allows the participant to receive knowledge as a gift from God. And remember what I said earlier, faith is not just merely belief or mere fidelity. It's much deeper. It's ontological. It's an ontological relationship with God and man, a way of, of being and living with God. And it's this faith that allows the participant to receive knowledge as a gift from God. And this knowledge both surpasses the limits of philosophy, human reason, and it grounds and it justifies the existence of knowledge arrived at by means of the human intellect. So we're not going to say you can't know anything at all. You can, but only in this way can we really know when God his gift of faith and participation 
between man and with man, bridging the gulf that St. Justin Popovich said is unbridgeable from man's point of view, then we'll be able to ground and justify human knowledge. And here's a great quote that expresses that. St. Justin Popovich explains, the power of truth from the other side responds to the powerlessness of man on this side. Transcendent truth crosses the gulf, arrives on our side of it, and reveals itself, himself, in the person of Christ, the God-man. In him, transcendent truth becomes imminent in man. The God-man reveals the truth and through himself. He reveals it not through thought or reason, because remember that was the problem, but by the life that's his. He not only has the truth, he himself is the truth. In him being and truth are one, therefore he in his person not only deifies truth, but shows the way to it. He who abides in him will know the truth, and the truth will make him free from sin, death, and falsehood. So, the solution to our epistemic predicament that we can't get out of, in which autonomous man's reason can obtain within its own sphere of reasoning, is a truth that's both personal and obtained through living a life of faith and humility by abiding the one who is in a position to know the truth. Because remember, as I said, we're not capable of solving this problem without falling into epistemic circularity, epistemic bootstrapping. And so we need help from one who is in a position to know. And as St. Justin Bobovich points out, it is him who is truth that bridges that gulf. Because even if God... The truth is transcendent. How do we ever get to it when we're still locked in kind of an empirical theology within our own reasoning, trying to reason up to whom who is incomprehensible and utterly transcendent? That's why God solves the problem by becoming incarnate, him who is truth, and not revealing just in terms of St. Justin Popovich says, not through thought or reason, but a life. It's the life that's his, the light of men, who solves the problem. And therefore, it's a truth that's both personal, and it's obtained by living a life of faith and humility, by abiding in the only one who's in a position to know the truth. And by uniting ourselves with Christ in this way, we can achieve true knowledge. For since, quote, in the person of the God-man, God and man are indissolubly united. The gulf, brothers and sisters, between man and God becomes bridged. And it's through the Theanthropos, our intellects are renewed, purified, and sanctified. They're deepened. They're divinized and made capable of grasping truths of life in the light of the God-man. In the God-man, absolute truth has in its entirety been given in a real and personal way. This is found in a life of faith, which leads us to consider what faith is. It is the Orthodox Christian faith that I'm speaking of. Specifically, the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. A faith that's uniquely distinct from what's articulated in other religions, other Christian faiths even, and philosophies. And as I said before, the faith's not a mere fidelity, a psychological attitude. Alex Nestor puts it, it's a state of communion with God that provides an ontological relationship between man and God. End quote. In other words, faith is a way of being. It's a way of existing in communion with God that restores the nature of man in the very deepest sense. Well, how does faith relate to knowledge then? Well, just as assumed to be knowledge that's particular to philosophy and science, assuming now that we can sufficiently ground and justify those disciplines if that's true, then there's also assumed to be 
knowledge exists that's particular to faith. And unlike the West project of natural theology, the Orthodox Church, however, they makes no distinction between natural and supernatural revelation. For natural theology in the West is what man can know by the power of his intellect alone, unaided by any revelation. But as I said, the Orthodox Church doesn't make this distinction between natural and supernatural. For as Dimitri Stanoloy says, quote, natural revelation is known and understood fully in the light of supernatural revelation. Or we might say that natural revelation is given and maintained by God continuously through his divine act, which is above nature. That is why St. Maximus, the confessor, does not pause an essential distinction between natural revelation or the biblical one. And according to him, this latter is only really the embodying of the former in its historical persons and actions. Therefore, there's those things that the human reason can discover from nature, what we'd call natural revelation, only, only if grounded in the light of supernatural revelation. And of course, there are those hidden mysteries of God that require a special divine revelation which, without which they could never be known. But by the assistance of grace from God, faith that we're talking about here is seen to be a different order than the knowledge obtained from natural revelation or through discursive reason, which relies on sense, perception, and experience. And it's often assumed by those outside of the faith or even those within natural theology to operate on the powers of the intellect alone. In the orthodox theology, knowing sciences about God is done primarily through humility and asceticism. Theology is a science performed in humility. In other words, a study carried out in prayer. And you know Evagoras' famous quote, the one who has purity in prayer is true theologian, and the one who is true theologian has purity in prayer. However, this sort of knowledge located in the mystery of God that the human mind cannot obtain for itself can only be received and embraced in faith by really properly reorientating oneself in correct relation to the living God. Recall Moses' encounter with God on Mount Sinai when he's told that no one can see God's face and live. Now, on the surface, this might seem like a puzzling passage. It, it was for me. Because it causes one to wonder, how is God, who is life itself, how could God ever be the cause of death upon one seeing him? But here, Gregory of Nyssa explains the passage and the relationship between life and intelligibility in his book, The Life of Moses. He states, Scripture does not indicate th this to see God's face causes death of those who look. For how could the face of life ever be the cause of death to those who approach it? On the contrary, the divine is by its nature life-giving. Yet the characteristic of the divine nature is to transcend all characteristics. Therefore, he who thinks God is something to be known does not have life. Because he's turned from true being, to antos, antos, to what he considers by sense perception to have being. True being is true life. This being is inaccessible to knowledge. Thus what Moses yearned for is satisfied by the very thing which leaves his desire unsatisfied. According to St. Gregory, to think, quote, God is an object of knowledge is to turn away from being to a, fan a phantom of one's own making, he states. And this is why, at least in part, the West scholastic project of natural theology is an attempt to see God as an object of knowledge and prove his existence using philosophy. As I've argued before, leads the West to worship their idea of God, a phantom of their own making, rather than God himself. For to properly know God is to 
radically reorientate oneself and follow him whose life. This is precisely what St. Gregory explains concerning Moses. When he explains he's only to see the back parts of God and not his face. Quote, for he who sees, sorry, he who follows sees the back. So Moses, who eagerly seeks to behold God, is now taught how he can behold God. To follow God wherever he might lead is to behold God. For he who moves to one side and brings himself to face his guide assumes a different direction for himself than the one his guide shows him. Therefore he, God, says to the one who's led, my face is not to be seen. That is, Do not face your God. If he does so, his course will certainly be in the opposite direction. For good does not look good in the face, but follows it. So what we see from St. Gregory, that Moses did not attempt to seek God as something to be known, but rather chose to become a follower of God, a follower of Christ, is what we're called to be. For an attempt to do otherwise is to face one's guide rather than to follow. And to face one's guide is to turn from true being to what one considers by sense perception to have being. And that, brothers and sisters, is a turn that will surely lead to death. Therefore, to reorientate oneself properly one must first reject the idea that reason could ever be justified in its own reasonings. Next, step two, one must begin to honestly investigate the conditions in which correct human reasoning and knowledge exist and operate. And here we're going to discover that reason bears a certain relation to faith. Human reason is found to exist on a bedrock of faith. In other words, when human reason reflects on itself, it finds something quite interesting and important. Reason takes faith in its reasonableness. You take faith that your operations are legitimate and they're going to lead to truth and obtain genuine knowledge of reality. That my faculties are such and such that I'm actually experiencing reality correctly. And even Aristotle knew that You can't have a demonstration of a demonstration of a demonstration of a demonstration that ultimately it lays on a bedrock of first principles that are taken on faith. And thus, we're able to find that that reason actually takes faith in its own reasonableness. And this becomes an acknowledgement that not only is faith an essential component to reason, But faith precedes reason as its foundations. Consider Hebrews, excuse me, Hebrews, when it states, through faith we comprehend and think how the ages have been produced. You can find that Hebrews 11, 3. Thus, faith, as Lossky explains, quote, allows us to think and it gives us true intelligence. Why? Because faith is the foundation of reason and rational thinking, a foundation that reason cannot secure on its own. Thus, when reason recognizes its own limits, we begin to see the beginnings of apophatic theology. And through apophatic theology of the Eastern Orthodox Church, that is the process of negating all terms predicated of God's essence, as the fathers teach, then one's led to a true knowledge of God. So you're removing, furthermore, in this hesychism, any prideful thoughts or any thoughts, any logos more that would prevent you from a true encounter with God. An apophatic theology, therefore, is intended to still and to quiet the mind, ridding of any thoughts, formulations, and concepts. And as I said before, The only thing preventing us from God is ourselves, our own ideas, conceptions, phantasms, 
of our own making, all our chatter and thought about what we think is real. And this really is both the Greek philosophic project and what was inherited by the West and the Latins to place all their faith in reason itself, his ability to justify itself and to get to God as kind of a Tower of Babel. And it's apophatic theology and sciencing and quieting the mind that will tear down those idols that we've made that will never get us to God and will never justify our own knowledge. That is, reason placing faith in, entirely in your own, in, in reason alone. And when we enter into this intellectual humility that we call apophatic theology and quiet the mind, ridding it from our own makings and our own thoughts, we'll begin to experience God. And the experience of God begins where the concepts end. And that's that experience of God that establishes a genuine and albeit a different type of knowing. So rather than approaching God with concepts as an object to be known, apophasis, the way of negation offered by the fathers, is simply to bring the mind into submission to the heart. Because it's the heart, the patristic sense of the noose, that's the spiritual organ, the only spiritual organ that connects us to God. It's not the mind. Now I'm not saying we get rid of the mind, but there's a proper, proper ordering in submission, the mind is brought into submission of the heart. And it's here that we humble the mind and we acknowledge the impossibility of any concept or predication of God in his essence. And not only does the use of apophaticism expose the limit of what's even thinkable, because I can't think beyond what's the limits of thought, what's unthinkable which my mind actually acknowledges in the word, I have an idea of the unthinkable, or what's greater than I could think, it also reveals that whatever is limiting the mind always transcends. That, in other words, that what limits always transcends the limits. And what transcends the limit of human thinkability clearly can't be a concept or an object of thought. Why? Because the notion of concept clearly entails a notion of apprehension, oftentimes a determination of essence. But we saw that's not possible with God's essence. And if God were an object of thought, he would remain within the idea of what's thinkable. But as I s said before, What's greater than can be thought can no way be captured by thought. So the mind recognizes its own limitations. And when you recognize your own limitations, you are acting humbly. You're humbling the mind. And as St. As John of Damascus, in referring to Dionysius, he explains that apophatic terms do not show what God is, but rather what he is not. It's impossible to say what he is in his essence, so it's better to discuss him by abstracting from all things whatsoever. For he does not belong to the number of beings, not because he does not exist, but that which transcends knowledge, sorry, but because he transcends all being and being itself. And if knowledge respects beings, then that which transcends knowledge will certainly transcend essence. And conversely, what transcends essence will transcend knowledge. So that's taken from St. John of Damascus, an exact exposition of the Orthodox faith, Book 1, Chapter 4, Paragraph 4. In short, God cannot be thought in concept as an object of thought, not in his essence and therefore is truly unknowable. St. Gregory Paulinus himself states, 
quote, God is not only beyond knowledge, but beyond unknowing. His revelation itself is truly a mystery of the most divine and extraordinary kind, since the divine manifestations, even if symbolic, remain unknowable by reason of the transcendence, end quote. And this is precisely the apophatic articulations and what they express concerning the reality of God. The West, though, in their adherence to the doctrine of absolute divine simplicity, even when they're using analogical language, so language by analogy, analogia entis, cataphatic, which is positive predications about God. God is good, God is love, etc. And negative language. God is infinite, omnipotent, um, um, unknowable. Sorry, omnipotent would be. Um, infinite, incomprehensible, immortal. These are all negative language. Nevertheless, when the West and their adherence to the absolute divine simplicity doctrine, they nevertheless consider God as, quote, a purely intellectual substance accessible to reason, possessing all perfections to an eminent degree, containing all ideas of all things, principle of every order in reality. That's, again, Lasky from Orthodox theology. But that stands in stark contrast to the Eastern Orthodox faith, which acknowledges God as utterly transcendent and his essence always greater than that can be thought. Beyond every predication, the name above all names. And Vladimir Lasky goes on to argue to evoke transcendence seriously in a Christian perspective. One must go beyond not only all notions of the created world, but also the notion of of the first cause of this world. So think about natural theology and cosmological arguments. To truly invoke transcendence, you go beyond God is not even the first cause. God must be conceived beyond physical transcendence. One must transcend, as Lasky goes on to explain, the transcendence of this first causality, which puts God in relation to the world. And that you'll also find that um, from Orthodox theology and Lasky. But St. Gregory Palamas himself emphasizes that God being both beyond concept or any form of knowing. And he expresses this by stating that, quote, God is not only beyond knowledge, but beyond un unknowing, as we'd heard before. Therefore, at this point, we're just left in utter silence since we have no knowledge of God and his essence through human reason. For as Augustine explains, quote, one cannot even say that God is ineffable, since by saying this, we say something and raise a battle of words which must be overcome by silence. That is Augustine. And hence, apophatic theology begins really to spiritually prepare the mind for hesychism to know God not as an object of thought but known as experienced by following God and participating in his eternal actions his divine and created energies his energias and here the orthodox Christian faith plays its crucial role not as contradicting reason but by completing what reason could not accomplish remember ask reason how does it justify its own reasonings and it appeals to itself and its reasonings to justify its own reasonings? So, reason cannot accomplish what it sets out to do. But faith, faith plays the crucial role here. Why? Because faith requires love. And love can go further than understanding. Because love can desire that which always remains unknown. But knowledge can't. Knowledge cannot reach that which remains unknowable and unknown. And not only does faith grant the devotee access to this tra radically transcendent God, again, not in his essence, but his energies. This is where we meet God. As we see, faith, the correct faith, grounds reason itself. Since, as we saw, reason proceeds from faith. And as we 
previously discussed and mentioned, this is seen from the fact that rationality must take faith in the permanence of its own rationality and the legitimacy of its processes. Human reason can never justify the permanence of its own rationality. It cannot prove that its methods are reliable and that its processes, in fact, do lead to knowledge without falling into vicious circularity and epistemic bootstrapping, as philosophers call it. Whatever arguments human reason uses to demonstrate the validity of human reason, they'll always be using exactly what's in question, human reason. Using human reason to demonstrate the validity of human reason is clearly question begging, as we stated before. That's to fall into epistemic circula circularity, and that invalidates its justification for knowledge. You can't justify <laughs> Your process is this way. Just why I can't justify that everything in this book is true by saying it told me in the book that everything in this book is true. It invalidates. So how does man find knowledge and truth when he cannot even determine whether such a thing even exists? He cannot use reason or appeal to anything he knows to show that knowledge exists since he hasn't establish those as being true. Knowledge and reason, as I said, are suspect. But Clement of Alexandria points out, quote, if anyone should suggest that scientific knowledge is provable by the help of reason, he must realize that the first principles of reason are not provable. By faith alone, he says, it is possible to arrive at the first principles of the universe. This is an excellent quote from Clement of Alexandria in the Stromatis, Book 2, Chapter 4. Therefore, standing alone in uncertainty of his reason, man is incapable, let's realize that, of discovering whether knowledge exists. And as I said, man needs help. Help from one who is in a position to know, from one who's not in the same epistemic quagmire that man is one who is capable of delivering the truth to those who have fallen from the grace to know. Man requires divine assistance. He requires divine revelation in order to deliver the truth and knowledge to what his intellect cannot obtain on its own. And the gift that God has given to man to obtain this truth is faith. The clues in rationality itself in that it takes faith in its own permanence. You realize that faith is the bedrock of rationality. And therefore, even to investigate the world and proceed investigating the world, reason must take faith in its abilities to acquire knowledge. Now I'd like to turn to Immanuel Kant because just as Kant in the transcendental deduction of the critique of pure reason sought to find the transcendental conditions for the possibility of knowledge, so do we, so does the human mind, seek to find the grounds of its own knowing. As Kant further articulates, this is the mind's attempt to establish a conclusion, not by means of deduction, but rather to arrive at a conclusion transcendentally. That is the process whereby one shows that if the conclusion is not true, knowledge itself would not be possible. In our present case, what the mind finds upon reflecting upon itself is the following conclusion. God is the precondition, the ground, for the possibility of intelligibility and correct reasoning, i.e. knowledge. And it is faith, as Lasky had pointed out, that allows us to think since faith gives us true intelligence. Now, St. Clement declares and explicates on this when he says that, quote, knowledge is possible only because of faith and faith is a condition of knowledge of any kind. And here, St. Augustine's notion of the restless heart, man's restless heart, comes to mind, the dynamic 
moment of the human spirit yearning for the infinite in every act of knowledge sheds much light on our present inquiry. The human desire for knowledge, which Aristotle speaks about in the opening line of the metaphysics, all men by nature desire to know, is connected, intimately related to man's longing for God. Hence, man's desire to know, his desire for knowledge, always points to the existence of God. Why? Because God is the necessary condition for the possibility of any knowledge. Augustine also teaches that the divine light is the condition in which all objects are known. And even St. John the Apostle declares of Christ, in him was life, and he was the light of men. And it's been stated that intelligence proceeds from faith, that reason takes faith in its own permanence. However, the crucial part of that analysis is not that that the intellect takes faith in, its, in something or takes faith in its abilities to acquire knowledge. The crucial question here is what it takes faith in in order to justify that. If human reason takes faith in itself, as we see the Greeks, in fact, all of Western thought, the Latins and natural theology in the West and natural theology, human reason takes faith in itself, unaided, then clearly one cannot be justified in knowing that the mind can obtain genuine knowledge. Human reason must believe and presuppose as its starting point the only thing that can serve as the grounds for the possibility of its knowing and attaining knowledge. But there's only one candidate for that. There's only one candidate for satisfying such conditions, Christ the eternal Logos, Christ, the light of men, who illumines the minds of all human beings, becomes the unique presuppositional justification that makes true belief, which man can have, to be knowledge, true justified belief. And as Augustine explains, quote, the mind needs to be enlightened by the light from outside itself so that it can participate in truth because it itself is not truth. You will light my lamp, O Lord. Christ is the light, the word, and the nature of truth. And the Lord who is omniscient, who is not contingent upon anything, clearly is the one who is in a position to know. However, how are we to be helped and delivered from our ignorance when, as we said, the Godhead is ineffable and incomprehensible? St. John Damascus explains, God has not gone so far as to leave us in complete ignorance, nor has he left us in a position such that we cannot obtain the ground and conditions for the possibility of our knowledge. We can know him, and we can know the world. God has sent his son, Jesus Christ, who is both teacher of truth and truth itself. For as Augustine declares, quote, none other than you are teacher of the truth whatever and from whatever source it is manifest. And since Christ, by the way, that's from the Confessions, Book 10 of Augustine. And since Christ is the divine Logos, the image of God, quote, the incarnate Christ is able to act as mediator between God and mankind and provides human being with knowledge, both of God and about the reality in which he encounters. And the Orthodox Christian, recognizing the inadequacy of human knowledge, nevertheless finds that he's been given a path to knowledge through faith in Christ who opens up the possibility of knowing. He's the means whereby the human being comes to know God. As Clement explains, states, the face of God is the word by who God is manifested and made known. End quote. And this type of knowledge is obtained not by the power of the intellect through concepts of words and natural theology, cosmological arguments, but it's received often in silence, through humility, and by the power and grace of God. And here, the faithful devotee is lifted up to experience the truths, his divine energies that radiate from his holiness as rays of light. St. Matthew speaks about man's relationship with God, stating, quote, those 
who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The solution is a gift from God, really. And it's a gift from God when the mutual love between Creator and His creation is established. The bridge is united. And the Creator's gift of faith, therefore, is seen really to be the crown of knowledge. Again, faith is not a mere fidelity. It's not a psychological attitude. It is, as Lars Thunberg describes, true knowledge, the principles of which are beyond rational demonstration, for faith makes real the things beyond intellect and reason. End quote. Why? Because faith completes what reason could not accomplish on its own. And thus, to conclude, the only valid justification for the possibility of knowledge and experience is for reason to bring itself down into the heart, to locate itself within faith, acknowledging that it cannot autonomously satisfy the conditions for the possibility of knowledge, nor can it transcend its, its own limits and think beyond what's unthinkable, nor reach a knowledge of God in his essence. Reason must recognize the condition that it's in and humble itself in order that it may be exalted to experience a true knowledge of God's energies as much as he grants such knowledge possible to be seen in this life through divine revelation. For as Clement explains, quote, if a person has faith into the divine scriptures and a firm judgment, then he receives as an irrefutable demonstration the voice of God who has granted him those scriptures. The faith no longer requires the confirmation of demonstration. Blessed are those who without seeing have believed. End quote. The intellectual humility that we're talking about here is the metonia. It's the paragoge. It's the turning around. It's the reorientation required for the mind to turn away from its hubris, the knowledge that puffs up, and return to the grace and love of God. And the apophatic acknowledgments that declare God is incomprehensible, greater than can be thought, nevertheless entreat us, as Clement explains, to turn around and teaches us, quote, to follow the God who has given us the commandments, end quote. And they gently remind us, as he goes on to say, to search for God as far as possible and to make an effort to know him. This is the highest form of study, the supreme revelation, real knowledge not to be overthrown by reason. This has to be the only knowledge known to wisdom. And it's never separated from the practice of righteousness, end quote. The act of apophaticism, apophasis, as it relates to approaching to God, is itself an act of humility. As Alex Nesterook explains and expresses the same idea when he states, quote, apophaticism becomes a synonym for humility, end quote. For when the mind accepts and contemplates what the orthodox faith has already been given, namely that God's incomprehensible, utterly transcendent, a bow of both space and time and name and conception, as Clement of Alexandria states, invisible and capable of being circumscribed, as he goes on to state, always greater and better than can be thought. Then what happens when we admit this, when we engage in this act? The intellect humbles itself. Reason humbles itself. And consequently, when reason humbles itself, then God exalts the person to see what reason cannot. Clement describes this as the first movement of apophatic theology, quote, the mode of purification by confession, end quote. This is when, quote, the human being confesses his inability to progress toward the goal of his epistemological quest, namely the transcendent God by means of his own powers and acknowledges the absolute primacy of this goal, end quote. This is true theology. It's the true theology that the fathers speak about a study that brings the human being into an intimate relationship with the hidden God through Jesus Christ. For the ultimate goal of knowledge, or gnosis, imparted by and through Christ, is to bring about the most intimate possible relationship with God. And by means of the knowledge imparted by Christ, 
The true believer, as Clement goes on to explain, is able to gain glimpses of the divine mystery and progress as far as possible in this life towards knowledge of the divine, end quote. And for the Orthodox Christian, this is really the process of theosis. Hence, apophatic theology is not only correct reorientation, it becomes a way of being. Apophasis leads to a type of knowledge that transforms the person, transforms the person to a new being where the image of Christ is impressed on the believer and the devotee so that, quote, there is now a third image made as far as possible like the second cause, the essential life through which we live the true life, end quote. That's from Clement again. In this third divine image that Clement speaks of is the knower himself who is deified through Christ's salvific work. The apophatic ascent to the divine is therefore the only possible justification for intelligibility, science, logic, experience, morality, etc. For by admitting that God is beyond comprehension and greater than can be thought, the mind discovers that human reason and philosophy can only be justified if the mind acknowledges its ground, condition, and possibility for knowledge, and then understands that it cannot think that which passes the limits of human thought. Thus the apophatic acknowledgement is able to locate within faith the only criteria that satisfies the conditions for science of human reasoning, what we'd call philosophy, and allows us to legitimately acquire genuine knowledge. And this is exactly the same point that Lossky makes when he declares, quote, one must therefore start from faith, and that it is the only way to save philosophy. Philosophy itself, on the summits, demands the renunciation of speculation, questioning, it attains the moment of supreme ignorance, a negative way where the failure of human thought is acknowledged. And here philosophy ends in mysticism and dies in becoming the experience of an unknown God who can no longer even be named. It's a beautiful quote. And it is Christ who restores that failure of human thought thought failing to accomplish what it sets out to do, namely provide us with genuine knowledge. Since Christ is the perfect measure of all things, it is he who, as Lossky goes on to explain, breaks the closed systems in which philosophers imprison and denature the reflection of the living God in human thought. But he also brings his accomplishment to the intuitive attention which the philosophers have devoted to this reflection, end quote. It's Christ who offers us that gift of knowledge when we humbly approach him in faith through the act of apophasis by believing what the intellect cannot understand and comprehend. And as Clement of Alexandria declares, I believe so that I may understand. Credo ut intelligium. So that is my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Um... Also, I have another paper that I'm going to be delivering. It's, it's much more complicated than this um, that I'll be delivering on Friday. Um, that it goes kind of more in detail of critiquing natural theology, um, classical foundationalism. It goes into some theories about coherentism. Coherentism is kind of a response to classical foundationalism. My critique of coherentism, even though there's some similarities with orthodox um, approach, and then um, transcendental arguments in presuppositional apologetics. Although the, that terms the transcendental argument for the existence of God is popularized by Van Til, Bonson, and John Frame, um, they did not come up with this in a vacuum. They're borrowing these principles from the Fathers. So when you really dig into the Fathers of the Eastern Orthodox Church, you'll begin to see that the modus operandi and the Ordo Theologiae is not the same as natural theology. That in fact, they're using exactly what we would call transcendental arguments in presuppositional apologetics. So part of the paper that I'm writing, actually it's written, um, that I'm going to deliver at the conference on Friday is about that. But let's take some... Do we have any super chats? Yes. 
by the way, I got my super chats up. Thank you. Um, make sure if you haven't liked, like this video. Um, subscribe. Tell your friends, your family, your mom and dad to subscribe. I need to get my, we're almost at 2,000. When we do 2,000, we'll do a special um, celebration video for that. So is the walrus, thank you, $5, sends $5. Is the ultimate end of theosis and Christian journey union with God? Absolutely as much as possible, we're to become united with God. What God is by nature, we're to become united um, by grace in his divine energies. So notice, obviously, we couldn't be completely united with God and become God in his essence. So this is why the, another aspect of the essence energies um, doctrine and orthodoxy, why it's so important. Okay, what else do we have, guys? So, hopefully that turned out a little bit better. Thank you for being patient with my technical difficulties. And then we finally got this up. Do your prayers. Yeah, speaking of God not leaving us ignorant um, or without clues, what I was thinking by that was one of the clues is that rationality is taking faith in its own abilities. We just assume that our logic works. That's what I said. There's nobody that's presuppositionally neutral. We just all presuppose it's logic, arguments that a reason works. But in there is the clue that, you know, when Aristotle, again, in the posterior analytics, was able to show that if a truth is demonstrated by a deductive syllogism, and then that's demonstrated by deductive syllogism, that can't go on forever. Because if there's no ground, right, so think about it. If any one thing in the chain is wrong, then the whole thing's wrong. That you have to have a foundation. Now, this is what eventually develops into what we call classical foundationalism. But he grounds this in what he calls first principles. And first principles are not the product of rational demonstration. They're taken on faith. Now, unfortunately for Aristotle and Aquinas and the natural theologians, they put their faith as first principles, their epistemic starting points, not in God, but in sense perception, in the effects from God, and what they'd call self-evident propositions. The whole is greater than the part, self-evident principles, things that couldn't be doubted, stuff like that. And in doing so, again, they're engaged in circular reasoning, and they're putting faith in, and giving authority in a sense that this is how we know this is where we begin in something higher than God. And so this becomes problematic. But the clue that reason is rests on a bedrock of faith and not more reason all the way down is the clue that I'm talking about that God has given us away. Um, and not only that, <laughs> he sent He's incarnated himself. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, of the Holy Trinity, is a revelation to, in the light of men, to. So this is important, too. It's, it's, if God was just a simple monad, could satisfy the conditions of knowledge. Obviously, you'd be in the, the one in the position to know. But this kind of Greek ontology of God is. is simple monad cannot be accessed, accessed by human reason. That's the bridge that's, that needs to be, sorry, the gulf that needs to be bridged. Man on one side is saying, Justin Popovich says, and transcendent truth on the other. So even if that serves as the necessary, we're not going to be able to get it. So that's why
I think it just cut out for a second. Don't worry. I'm back. Let's go through some more questions and let me just give some shout outs to thank White Top, $2. Again, thank you, Walrus, $5 for your super chat. Adrian, um, let's see. Bonacera, Adrian. What they be Are you in um, Are you in Romania, or are you? If you're in Romania, it's quite late. <laughs> but maybe you're here in the United States, like me. Welcome, Adrian. Oh, it's morning time where you are. Buna dimiata. <laughs> Multimisk. Okay. Thank you, Adrian, for your Zeche. Um, I was going to say Zeche Dalar, but it's Zeche um, Euro. <laughs> Multimisk. Oh, Aust Austria. Don Nejuta. Any other questions, brothers and sisters? Yeah, I'm super excited about this other paper too. Um, it'll be interesting, again, to get some feedback from some of the best Orthodox scholars in the world, actually, or definitely in the United States. Well, this is kind of why we do this too. Um, we present papers, you know, if you're just locked inside of your head and it's like, wow, what a great paper. And then you've got to send out somebody, you know, this isn't that great. You need to work on it. So getting outside of our heads and, you know, especially giving this to people who are much better than, than ourselves is helps us refine our thoughts. Think about, um, certain objections and how to answer them and so i'm excited about that also i will be heading out sunday to my clergy conference and then off to another conference so your prayers are appreciated i'm going to see if i can stop by saint anthony's monastery on monday and um, yeah, feel free to add any comments. I'm gonna put the papers on, I have some papers on, let's see, academia.edu. I'll put some more up on, I haven't been good about staying up to date with academia edu and like it used everything used to be free on this and then they get you hooked on it and then it's like now you've got to upgrade to let's see if i can get my page up here and then i'll just link it to bear with me one second yeah, the internet's been really slow here. Okay, it's going to be listed under my pagan name because remember, guys, I teach at the university. Two jobs. One is clergy and one is university philosophy professor. Um, so, But under the title, too, it'll have my clergy name, Father Deacon. Oh, nice. So let me post this. For you guys. So you can find some papers there. Um, like I said, I'll try to put some more papers up on there as well. Um, I 
other thoughts? Thank you. S. Larson, is it Scott Larson? I'm trying to figure out what the S is. I just wish I could figure out what happened with this thing. Because look, it's a good mic. I got a good mic here. I've got this preamp, all this good equipment that was donated to me by my dear friend. Um, and I had trouble with it. I've, I haven't had trouble in the past, maybe once or something like that. But So I don't know really what happened. Um, I'm glad all of you are there to help me with that. And we're going to be, Jay Day and I are going to be putting out a book. Um, hopefully soon. It's part of the reason why I'm doing these papers is to get kind of feedback and hear how people um, And then um, I'll probably dumb it down a little bit and uh, to make kind of more popularized uh, um, for like the book. Oh, I wonder if the cable has a short. Yeah, could be. Could be, my friend. Um, let's see. Well, it's not like I'm the only one that has technical problems. So what I'm going to do on that previous one is just go back and hit and delete it. So that one's not up because that one was that one was junk, wasn't it? You guys must have been so frustrated. Thank you so much for your your patience on that again. I think I've maybe I've maybe even lost some people. That's funny. Okay, um, let's see. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, Windows 10. Yeah, so it could be several different things with. Also, I'm thinking that an earlier time, maybe around five o'clock, might be good. So to get more people? What do you guys think? So thank you so much for your super chats and your support. Um, also, if any of you are interested in tutoring, um, when I get back from all these conferences, I've talked to people. Some people on the Discord server are very interested in this. Some of you are interested in apologetics. Um, I know um, Jay also does some tutoring and philosophy. And, but I wanted to do, I'm in Pacific uh, Standard Time Zone over here up in California. So, what I'm thinking is when I get back, we're going to start doing, in order to prepare people for apologetics, you need the foundational, and the foundations, and that's logic. And so, because I am also a professor of philosophy teaching logic, um, I have plenty of materials, slides. Um, in fact, I can actually get you a free book, a PDF version, so we could go through that. And then... By doing a group, let's say we do like Google Chats or something like that, I can bring the, the rate down um, and give you a much more reasonable rate, more people versus like a, sometimes I've, I've done one-on-one -on -one tutoring privately. And 
people really enjoy that, but it, you know, you might want to do that more frequently. That might be too expensive. So we came up with this idea that in fact, doing like kind of a group classroom, um, Google chats, logic, introduction to logic, um, might be very beneficial for, uh, people. So I will keep you updated on that. If anybody's interested in that, feel free to leave a comment that, uh, Father Deacon, I'm interested in the logic um, course and possible good times for you. And I'll put that together and we'll get a good class going and I will give you an excellent education and how to identify arguments, how to construct them basic and fallacies and formal fallacies I mean, we're not going to go too far i'm not going to get you into probably predicate logic unless some of you want um, a more advanced one um, let me know i might can always do separate sessions to do kind of more uh, advanced logic uh, predicate calculus two tables um, logic stuff like that let me know but um, i doubt most people would want that. So we're going to start with an introduction to logic arguments. Because again, that's going to be the foundation for apologetics. And it's just going to be good apart from apologetics too. It's going to teach you how to critically read through text. Know what garbage is on TV. These people are liars. What they're saying doesn't make any sense. It's a gobbledygook. Um, so let me know. Put a comment. If you're interested on um, this video here and preferable times or send me a private message. Anybody else? Otherwise. I saw Joe, you're, you're here. Welcome, Joe. Gonna miss you, brother, on my trips to the conferences. Okay, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now endeavor into ages of ages. Amen. Through the prayers of our Lord, the prayers of our Holy Father, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us and save us. Have a blessed evening, um, Christ among us, and I will see all of you shortly, hopefully with another video. So forgive me for taking so long. Again, um, two papers, applying for this full-time position, and actually starting up. I started uh, back teaching last week, uh, this week, so it's been busy. I've been focusing on that. Um, but now things are kind of situated, I'll have more time. So blessings, and thank you again.